Well, welcome this morning. It is good to be here with all of you. Um, I am grateful to, to be here at the Kesslinger campus this morning. I want to welcome all of you who are joining us online and our Mill Creek campus, which is the campus I am typically at uh, on a Sunday morning, is joining us uh, as well via simulcast. And as Paige mentioned, um, and as they mentioned in the announcements at, at Mill Creek, there is a lot that's happening here in, in this fall at Chapel Street. And I want to encourage you um, to consider the possibility of, of beginning a new rhythm. I think the fall for many of us has a way of being kind of one of those opportunities to reset. And, and there is a number of things available to you, whether you are one of our middle school or high school students, if you are uh, looking for men's ministry or women's ministry, if you're looking for small groups, there's Rooted, there's our care groups, there's a lot happening. And, and across the board, we're, it's all happening because we're, we're hoping to see the church grow in deeper connection, relationship to each other, and deeper in connection to, to our God. And um, so if you have questions about any of that at any of our campuses or online, um, you can always go to one of our welcome desks in person, or we encourage you to look at our website as well and reach out to one of the ministry uh, leaders, and, and we'll get back to you because uh, we're here to, to help you get connected in those. As Paige said, I want to begin by turning to Psalm uh, 146. I am aware that we're in a study of Proverbs. Um, Jeff pointed that out when I shared my preaching outline and preaching team this week. He's like, you know we're in Proverbs, right? I said, I do. But I, I, wanna, I want to begin here because I want this description of what we're going to read here to kind of be the backdrop for our conversation today. This is Psalm 146. The psalmist writes, hallelujah, my soul praise the Lord. I will praise the Lord all my life. I will sing to my God as long as I live. Do not trust in nobles and a son of man who cannot save. That, that, we're going to make that our life verse as the political season heats up. When his breath leaves him, he returns to the ground. On that day, his plans die. Happy is the one whose help is the God of Jacob, whose hope is in the Lord his God, the maker of heaven and earth, the sea and everything in them. He remains faithful forever, executing justice for the exploited and giving food to the hungry. The Lord frees prisoners. The Lord opens the eyes of the blind. The Lord raises up those who are oppressed. The Lord loves the righteous. The Lord protects resident aliens and helps the fatherless and the widow and he frustrates the way of the wicked. The Lord reigns forever, Zion. Your God reigns for all generations. Hallelujah. This psalm, in addition to just being a beautiful description of, of God's kingdom, right? It gives us this picture, this understanding of the nature and character of God so that, that we understand how God is operating in our world is this outflow of who he is. It gives us this picture, this understanding of what things are like in his kingdom. And so as we dive into this conversation this morning about the nature of, of wisdom and justice, as we'll see it in the book of Proverbs, I want this description from Psalm 146 to provide just to kind of be running in the back of our heads as we think about everything that we're going to learn here today. Uh, from the time we are young kids, typically most of us develop a fairly defined sense of, of what is just and what is unjust. Right? Oftentimes in the vernacular of a child, it gets it gets described as fairness. When I was uh, a young kid, my older brother and I, both of us have birthdays in November. So those, those family birthday parties um, often were a combined event for, for my older brother Scott and I. And uh, one year, my grandma, who recognized that she would be bringing some presents over for Scott and myself at our birthday party, was concerned about my little brother. That, that he wouldn't have anything. And so, and as thoughtful as she was, she went out and she purchased a little Hot Wheel. And I still, to this day, I remember it because it, there it is. It was Snoopy on his doghouse driving off. This was the Hot Wheel that she 
purchased for my little brother. But as the party began to unfold, and as Jared, my younger brother, is looking at these piles of presents that Scott and I are beginning to open, and he looks at his Hot Wheel, he, he began to feel this internal sense of injustice. And he protested. Um, because the, the image I have of my younger brother is him staring at this Hot Wheel, looking at our presence, staring at his Hot Wheel, and just chucking that thing across the room. I remember my dad, if you were at Mill Creek last week, you heard me tell a story about, uh, we were talking about wisdom and words, and I swore, ironically, at a family birthday party, my dad swept me away to have a conversation. In this case, my younger brother got swept away to have a conversation. We are born, we begin to build, from the time we are a child, this, this sense of what justice ought to be. Our culture, our, our politics are full of cries for justice. And I would contend that there is almost a universal desire for justice. We all want it, or at least we say we do. But the problem is, is we can't seem to quite agree on what it is. And, and there's all kinds of debate on how it is achieved. Furthermore, the natural trajectory of human relationships is, is not towards justice, but rather injustice. Martin Luther King, uh, when he just said that uh, we shall overcome because the, the arc of the moral universe is long, but it bends toward justice, when he said that, he is describing a uniquely Christian or faith-based vision. Right? We, we, justice in our own experience, right, to act justly, it requires a, an active choice. It requires a, a higher vision or a better story that we're operating out of in order to act in opposition to my natural inclinations. And we can be adept at recognizing injustice in others. We can have a honed-in vision as it relates to culture at large. And we certainly are experts at, at calling out injustice when it is imposed on us or it's, it's imposed on somebody that we love. But the real challenge is, is when we experience and have to examine our own hearts and minds and confront the injustice that exists in me. In many ways, when we talk about justice right there is this personal and this corporate sense of, of what is required. And as we're gonna discover in Proverbs today, what is essential in our efforts to pursue justice, what is necessary for that to be realized is, is going to be wisdom. That without wisdom, we will never gain justice. And so today, as we look at Proverbs together, I want us to look at four things. I want us to look at the standard of justice, the call of justice, the way of justice, and then finally, the person of justice. Let's begin by looking at the standard of justice. And again, now let's flip over to, to Proverbs. Proverbs chapter one, I wanna just remind us how this entire uh, manual on wisdom begins. This is Proverbs chapter one, beginning in verse one. The Proverbs of Solomon, son of David, king of Israel, for learning wisdom and discipline, for understanding insightful sayings, for receiving prudent instruction in righteousness, justice, and integrity. So at the very outset, of what Solomon wants to accomplish, why he is putting this together, he says there are two things. There is both substance, meaning what is wisdom? How do we gain it? How do we apply it in our lives? How do we define it? What's it rooted in? Which in verse seven, if you remember, he says it's established, it's the result of fear of the Lord. And then he says it, it's about the expression of justice and righteousness, or of wisdom, and righteousness, and justice, and integrity. The stated objectives of, of this book of Proverbs is to teach us how to be wise, how to live and exercise wisdom in our lives and, and in our world. In the very outset, Solomon makes the point that wisdom is required if we are ever going to, to experience justice. 
And so one of the questions that we have to ask ourselves is, what is the standard? How do we determine what is just? Many of you have heard me uh, say before that I am a, a hobbyist woodworker. Uh, in my spare time, I, I like to design and build furniture. I haven't been doing nearly enough of it lately, but it's, it's one of those things that I kind of escape to and, and I love. And I have this, this uh, apron that I wear when I'm woodworking that carries kind of my essential, most used tools with me. And of all the tools in that apron, the tool that, that gets pulled out most frequently, maybe, maybe only second to my pencil, is a, uh, a combination square like this. Because this tool is, is absolutely necessary if the, the cuts that I'm going to make, if the work that I'm going to do is going to be square. If I want joints that are tight, if I don't want gaps in my, my furniture, then this tool is going to be the thing by which I, I set the standard. And, and really gifted craftsmen, guys that do this at a, at a high level, right? they will spend serious money on a square because from that tool, everything else will get registered off. So the question that we want to wrestle with, that we want to ask ourselves is then what is the standard? What, what, what is the, the true north from which we can chart a course? And, and what Solomon describes and what we saw in Psalm 146 is that it is the nature and character of God. And for our purposes, right, it's the nature and character of God that has been described to us in his word. In fact, the standard, flip over to, uh, to Psalm 21 real quick. Psalm 21. Not Psalm, Proverbs. I keep doing that, sorry. Proverbs 21, verse seven and eight. Solomon writes this, he says, the violence of the wicked sweeps them away because they refuse to act justly. A guilty one's conduct is crooked, but the behavior of the innocent is upright. Those two terms, they're crooked and upright. These get repeated throughout scripture as, as a primary metaphor for how we understand what is just and what is unjust. It's upright or it's crooked. It aligns to the standard or it is going in a different direction. It's wavy because it has adopted some faulty or some crooked standard. It's off. And again, and kind of like woodworking, right? If you are off a degree and if you have multiple parts and that gets played out, you're gonna have a, a very crooked looking piece of furniture. The question that we ask ourselves is, is what standard am I using to understand, to apply wisdom to as it relates to justice? And of course, this idea of, of being crooked or off-center, right? This is, this is told to us, and you'll remember this back in January when we were studying Genesis together. You remember this prior to the fall, Right? Creation is living in right relationship to God and to each other. They're living in alignment with God's design for his created world. And then Genesis 3 happens. Adam and Eve decide for themselves that they want, they want to be the, the determiner of what is good and what is evil. And they follow a crooked standard. And so where there had been flourishing... And when there had been unity and when there had been life, there now was hiding and there was um, infighting and, and there was death. Immediately, immediately after the, the entrance of sin into the picture, we see selfishness, we see blaming, greed develops, jealousy, division, and, and within the first generation, murder. Humanity is now living by a standard out of alignment with their design and their designer. So both Psalm 146 and, and the, the purpose of Proverbs that's stated in verse 1, so is that we understand what is just to be in alignment with the nature and the character of God. And then we see it being described, being played out in the kingdom that he will usher in. Wisdom according to Proverbs, comes from God. And wisdom is required for there to be justice. 
Secondly, we see the call of justice. We see the call of justice. Last, last uh, spring, there was an epic um, kind of meltdown in a baseball game when Kyle Schwarber, you might remember him, he was on the World Series Cubs team. He, uh, he plays for the Phillies, and he was called out on strikes. And Angel Hernandez, the umpire, had been having a bad night. Like, he, he was kind of way outside the strike zone, and this kind of, like, was the straw that broke the camel's back. Like, Schwarber gets called out, he walks away, and then in his brain, he immediately decides this is worth getting tossed out for. And he throws his bat, and he goes back to the plate, right? And what we see here is he goes, and he starts in front of uh, Angel Hernandez, the umpire. He starts to define where the, the box is. And then he stands on the side, and he shows where the ball is, right? And he makes this big spectacle. It was epic. I was going to show you the video, but YouTube wouldn't let me today. So, um, and, and the point is, like, we all know, we agree on what the standard is. We, we have a sense of it. The problem that he's pointing out to Hernandez is you're not operating according to it. You're not living in alignment with it. Again, from Proverbs, look at this. This is in Proverbs chapter 14 now. I'm gonna, I'm gonna read a couple different verses. The one who opposes the poor insults his maker. The one who is kind to the needy honors him. Verse, uh, chapter 22, verse two. Rich and poor have this in common. The Lord makes them all. Then jump down to verse eight and nine. The one who sows injustice will reap disaster and the rod of his fury will be destroyed. A generous person will be blessed for, for he shares his food with the poor. And these verses take, uh, what I want us to see here is I want us to see the correlation in this expression or action of justice and how it has both a horizontal, meaning person to person element to it, and also a vertical or person to God aspect to it. All these verses include this. The standard that we discuss, like all wisdom and Proverbs, it's, it's not something that we just sort of take in and think about in kind of abstract form. But rather, Solomon's point, and the point throughout all scripture, is that we live it. So much so that it says, when I, when I oppress the poor, according to Proverbs 14, I am insulting the maker who has embedded in that person the very image of God. Timothy Keller wrote a book called um, Generous Justice. And it's really an excellent resource on this topic, but in the first chapter of that book, he, he talks about how frequently in the Old Testament the words justice and righteousness are paired together, literally dozens of times. Because together, justice and righteousness demonstrate the holistic and restorative heart of God. It involves both the relational element that exists between us and God and between our fellow human beings, as well as the work of repairing and restoring when we discover broken relationship, which is one way of describing injustice. It is both the standard and the application. It is both personal and it is also public, right? It's in our, our homes, but it's in our cities, and it's, it's most certainly intended to be in our churches and our places of worship. If you remember back when we were uh, earlier in this series in Proverbs chapter eight, wisdom is personified as a woman and she is making her appeal. And this is what she says in, in Proverbs chapter eight, verse one. She says, doesn't wisdom call out? Doesn't understanding make her voice heard? At the heights, over, uh, heights overlooking the road and at the crossroads, she takes her stand. Beside the gates leading into the city, at the main entrance, she cries out. Like, wisdom is personified as making her appeal in all these civic centers, these, these places, these public places. As it relates to the application of, of justice, as we think about this as, as a church, as the body of Christ, like, Lord, give us wisdom to live this out. Because one thing that scripture makes abundantly clear throughout its pages is that our God finds gathered worship to him 
where there is injustice present, like when we turn a blind eye to justice and then we gather to worship, he finds it intolerable. In fact, in Amos chapter five, he said, it's it's like a a, a stench to me. I, I can't stand it. The call of justice is to join our king and his work found that we just read in, in, in Psalm 146, to execute justice for the exploited, to feed the hungry, to free prisoners, to open the eyes of the blind, to raise up the oppressed, to protect resident aliens, to help the fatherless and the widow. This is our call. It is the work of our king, and it is a description of his kingdom which then leads us to the way of justice, the way of justice. There's one example of this in in the Old Testament, and, and, and one of my favorites is when God calls Moses to go be his voice for the people of Israel and in opposition to Pharaoh. And if you go back and you look at Exodus chapter four, you'll remember that when when God comes to Moses, Moses' first response, his first reaction is not one of like, sweet, I'm in. You know, like, I wanna be a part of this. That sounds exciting. In fact, he immediately starts to kind of list all kinds of reasons as to why he's not the guy, why he's underqualified. He doesn't have the gift set that's required. And there's this exchange that happens between Moses and God. And at one point in time, God says to Moses, what, what do you have in your hand there? And of course, Moses is a, a shepherd. He's got his, his rod and his hand, his shepherd's staff. And God says to him, throw it on the ground. And he throws it on the ground and it immediately turns into a snake. And then he says, well, grab it, grab it by the tail, which I, from what I understand with snakes, you're not supposed to do that. But he grabs it by the tail and it and immediately returns into the shape and the form of his shepherd's staff. And the point that, that that exchange is making to Moses is I'm asking you to bring what you have, but, but it'll be me that empowers it, God says. It'll be me that, that bears the fruit. Oftentimes when I consider the face of injustice in our society, in our culture, in my own heart and mind, right? when you think about the scope and scale of it, it can be overwhelming. In fact, if you're anything like me, there's times when you're just sort of paralyzed by it. I feel unqualified and ill-equipped. Right? I feel incapable of answering the call. But again, Proverbs is going to speak into this as well to help us see and understand what what we have in our hand. What is it that we can bring and say, God, this is, I'm laying it here in front of you. Can you use this to do your work, to pursue justice? In Proverbs, we see that one of those things that that God highlights or that Proverbs highlights is is our power and influence. Here, speaking to leaders and authority, this is Proverbs chapter 29, verse four. Solomon writes this, he says, by justice, a king brings stability to a land, but a person who demands contributions destroys it, demolishes it. In chapter eight, verse 15, this is wisdom speaking now again. It is by me, by wisdom, that kings reign and rulers enact just law. So, why we might look at those verses and kind of disassociate because we don't see ourselves as people of influence or wielding any particular power, right? The point that it makes is that it's, that's not the deciding factor. That's not what ultimately is, is key, is how much power or influence you wield, but rather is it something that I am willing to hand over to God to say, what, can you use whatever it is that I have? Can, can you use where I have influence? And if, if you are really in relationship with any other human being, you have some degree of influence. So none of us get to kind of hear this and sort of think about, our leaders or somebody else, like internalize this. Because this act, this call that we see laid out in scripture, right, is for us to bring it and say, okay, God, the the hands are open. Can you use what I have? Can you use it in my community? Can you use it in my place of work? 
We use it in the halls of my school, in my home, in my marriage, with my kids. Lord, can you use my influence, my power to bring about your justice? Secondly, so our, uh, Proverbs points out that we have our resources or our money. Chapter 16, verse 8 in Proverbs, but a little with righteousness is greater than income. Is, it, it, let me start over. But a little with righteousness than great income with injustice. Right? One of the most practical ways that we see restorative justice happen throughout Scripture is the result of, of generosity. Think about the story that Jesus tells of the Good Samaritan when he comes across a complete stranger who has been beaten and left for dead. And he extols this, uh, this Samaritan because the Samaritan at great cost to themselves took up the cause of this person that he does not know to see them restored and returned to health. It's looking at what God has given to us and asking ourselves the question, how does God want to use this to fulfill the call of justice? Because again, in the Proverbs and Psalms as well, we, we understand it all belongs to him. We're stewards of it, but it's not ours. And we're asking the self, ourselves the question, what do you want to do with it? Then thirdly, Proverbs teaches us to use our voice. It teaches us to use our voice. This is Proverbs 31, verse 8 and 9. It says, speak up for those who have no voice. For the injustice of all who are disposed. Speak up, judge righteously, Defend the cause of the oppressed and the needy. Where can you lend your voice to the cause of and defense of the oppressed and the needy? And and I'll say, right, what we talked about last week when we were talking about wisdom and words, it, it applies here. And what we will talk about this fall when we study James and we talk about action, words that result in action, it it applies here. And I understand there are all kinds of necessary conversations. One of the mistakes that we make in our conversations about justice is we try to take very complex things and, and make them simple. In fact, sometimes maybe I, I use that as a reason to be uninvolved. And I don't pretend to stand up here today and say that I have all the solutions for injustice in our world and in our society and relationships. I don't. But what I think scripture invites us into is to recognizing it and saying, Lord, give me wisdom. Help me to speak into this. Can you use my voice as a means to bring about your kingdom? When God saw Moses and he was gonna free his people, from the torment of a Pharaoh in Egypt, he said to Moses, what do you have in your hand? What do you have there? Give it to me and see what I will do. Which brings us then to the person of justice. And, and I'll, I'll wrap up with this, but I wanna read from um, the prophet Isaiah. We oftentimes read this, this passage at Christmas time, um, but it describes Jesus coming and the kingdom that he's going to usher in. This is Isaiah chapter 9, verse 6 and 7. He says, For a child will be born for us, a son will be given to us, and the government will be on his shoulders, and he will be named Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Eternal Father, Prince of Peace. The dominion will be vast. And its prosperity will never end. He will reign on the throne of David and over his kingdom to establish it and sustain it with justice and righteousness from now on and forever. The zeal of the Lord of armies will accomplish this. What Jesus, and when Jesus took on flesh and became one of us, he ushered in, he instituted his kingdom He recruited to himself a people that were going to live and operate in the way of Jesus. In Romans chapter three, Jesus is described as both the one who is just, but also the one who is the justifier. The heart of justice begins and it ends with Jesus. 
And there will be a day, Scripture tells us, that when Jesus is going to return as king, and he is going to establish his kingdom in full, it will be the fulfillment of perfect justice. But until that day comes, you and I, if if you're here this morning and, and you call yourself a follower of Jesus, you and I are called to live in the way of Jesus as agents of his justice as agents of this kingdom that, that Isaiah looked forward to, that, that Psalm um, set praise before God for. We're called to live in the way of Jesus as agents of his justice because he is the standard, because he extends the call and he is the way because Jesus is justice. When he taught his disciples to pray, He taught him to pray, may his kingdom come and his will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Lord, give us wisdom that we might be just. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for this day and this opportunity again just to be in your word. And Lord, for each of us, we recognize that in our own world, our own understanding of all that's unfolding around us and in our own hearts and minds, there are, there are parts of us that have not yet been fully conformed to the work that you want to do. And so, Jesus, we just we want to lay ourselves before you as living sacrifices that you might continue transformative work in us, that we might more effectively represent your kingdom the work that you want to do, the nature and character of God. You are the standard and help us to live accordingly. And it's in your name we pray, amen. Amen. Before I offer this morning's benediction, if we can pray with you today, uh, our prayer team is available each and every week out in the glass room in our lobby. We'd love to meet with you, whether you have something just you want to celebrate a praise or a concern that you want people partnering with you. If you have questions about how to get involved, programs that are launching over the next couple of weeks, our welcome desk is there. If you're new with us, I encourage you take a moment to, to swing by there as well and introduce yourself. And then lastly, uh, if you came prepared to give this morning, our generosity boxes are, are by the doors as you exit. We're so grateful um, for all the ways that you partner with us in, in ministry. And now receive this morning's benediction. Go in the name of Jesus Christ, the one who is just and our justifier. May your kingdom come and your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us wisdom and it's in your name we pray. Amen.